it was, it was such a great, valuable experience. And I know a lot of people who are like, oh, well, boot camps are kind of like, they're a rip off, you know, they're kind of like hustling, if you, hustling you for the money, but it really is about like what you, you get what you put into it. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP, HP's high compute workstation grade line of products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Mikiko Bazili. Mickey is an informally taught machine learning engineer focused on combining five plus years of experience in data analytics and data science, growth and engineering to make machine learning useful by developing tooling, infrastructure and processes for data scientists at MailChimp. Prior to MailChimp, Mickey's worked as a data scientist and analyst in a number of industries like solar, 3D modeling software, anti-piracy tech, health tech and real estate tech for companies like Autodesk, Teladoc, WalkMe, etc. In her spare time, Mickey mentors, speaks, and writes about her experience bootstrapping her learning and succeeding without a master's or a PhD. Her goal is to help shatter the myths around breaking into data science and machine learning and encourage public learning through LinkedIn. Both Mickey and I come from a mixed Caucasian and Asian homes, and we talk a lot about how finding ourselves between these two cultures was both a liberating uh, and alienating experience. She also touches on how she was able to find herself after college by trudging her own path that her parents didn't quite understand. Finally, we also touch on how and why she transitioned from data science to machine learning engineering. This is a loaded episode, and we also discuss her experience going through a data science bootcamp. I really enjoyed speaking with Mickey, and I'm excited to share this episode with you all. Mickey, thank you so much for coming on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast today. Obviously, We've met through Harpreet's excellent happy hour. Yeah. You're always saying such intelligent stuff about machine learning operations, and I'm constantly learning from you. So I figured, why not bring you in and have a whole lot more people learn from your experiences? Uh, I know you're also a lot more than just uh, a, a mean a machine learning ops figurehead. You have a really cool and unique history and story of getting into the data science and then machine learning uh, engineering fields. And I'm really happy to be able to talk with you about this and, and to tell your story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, it's really funny that we like everyone I've met has been through Herpreet's happy hour. So I'm really glad that you started. And it was really fun actually being there while he was like thinking and coming up with the idea. Because the way we met was that um, this was like two, three years, should we say one to two PCQ po or pre quarantine, COVID quarantine. Um, so, one or two years before that, when I was mentoring at Data Science Dream Job, that's how I met Harpreet. Um, I was also a student there for a little bit, or I, I was part of the program. Um, you know, and watching him grow and really kind of take off with the idea, first trying it out with the RSO Data Science podcast, and then getting the brilliant idea to do like the Friday happy hour. So, it's been wonderful being able to meet all these different people that he's brought together. It's funny how you can always go like, how did you meet each other? Ah, Herpreet, yep, RSO Data Science. So yeah, so it's fun. I'm excited to talk to you. Yeah, well, that, you know, there's such a beautiful art in like connecting people and like it, it works out really well for him too because everyone who comes on the show that I've I've met through the happy hour, I'm like, oh, like Harpreet sent me over, check out his podcast, do all this stuff. So I think he's sneakily, <laughs> sneakily implanting that in there. Um, but the first question that I always like to ask people to get them a better understanding of you and your story and your background is, how did you first get interested in data? You know, was this like a pivotal moment or was this sort of a, a, a journey or a story? And you did mention something related to that uh, that involves the dress form or the mannequin that is behind you, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Yeah, totally, totally. So it's funny, I, I feel like my story is always a little bit disappointing because I didn't really have any of these like breakthrough moments. Um, I think for better or worse, you can kind of describe my sort of journey into data and to some degree out of it um, is just really about just trying to do the next best thing and just trying to like iterate and just kind of figure out the next step. So, um, so you know, way back in the day, I went to uh, UC San Diego for bio biomedical engineering pre-med, um, ended up basically almost failing out of that program. And so I ended up taking five years to do anthropology and economics because at some point um, after two years of basically 
sort of oscillating between getting a 4.0 one quarter and then getting like a 1.0 the next quarter with like, yeah. So my average GPA, like graduating um, UCSD, even though I was getting kind of like A's and B's the last year of it was a 2.4, I think, you know? So I think within the like year two, it basically was like, okay, all my, my, all my family's hopes and dreams of me, you know, becoming a doctor, right? The Holy Trinity, it's doctor, lawyer, engineer. Um, you know, it just, it, it didn't seem like the uh, med school thing was going to pan out. So uh, I pivoted to anthropology economics because um, it, part of it was, I was just looking for something engaging and fun in college, you know, after sort of going through so many periods of like just absolute failure. Um, but part of it was, I was really interested in how people thought, you know, and to some degree, like, I feel like a part of Asian culture <laughs> in a way, and also part of the uh, the immigrant experience, especially if you're like a second generation, so your parents immigrate to the U.S. and you are a kid that's growing up, right, as, a, as an American, um, a lot of it is sort of, you're not, you don't really question your elders, like there's a lot of these kind of structures that you inherit that are essentially, you know, around like not questioning how things are done, you know, you have to think or make decisions a certain way, and, you know, anthropology and economics, it was a really nice way for me to start making small gradual steps out of that sort of mold and kind of seeing how people lived around the world and more importantly how they approached decisions that we think would be really common so for example this is a really fun one um, that i like to toss to parents is uh you know do you have a baby room right in uh western and when i say western i mean american culture it's really common to have a separate room for the baby and like you have these really kind of cordoned off times like okay like these number of years are for the baby's development the baby has like a separate room you know we just sort of take that for granted but in a lot of cultures around the world that's actually not how children are raised and that's not how they're developed um in a lot of cultures in the world children are expected to start displaying signs of independence like around four or five years which in the us we'd be like oh that's too young but actually in a lot of like in a lot of cultures and especially cultures that emphasize having sort of big families, it's very, it's very, very typical for the older siblings to take that responsibility and to start sort of developing independence. Now, as an only child in <laughs> a Japanese household, that wasn't really what was encouraged of me. It was encouraged of me to kind of, you know, do what everyone said, do what everyone says is right, kind of conform, do that, right? So, okay, so I get out of college, you know, five years, you know, after I entered, um, with anthropology economics, and uh, I didn't really have any sort of plans. I didn't really know what to do after that. Um, and part of it, I think, and that was actually a really low point in my life because I had basically graduated with, um, you know, no money, no job prospects. Um, and also I was not really like, like a functional adult, you know, so I, I didn't have a driver's license. Um, I didn't know how to do my taxes. I didn't, I didn't even know how to write a resume. Like I didn't know how to interview. Um, I had a massive stuttering problem. Like it was, there was a lot of these like handicaps and, you know, so I went to school in San Diego and at some point I just, I couldn't seem to like get a job, even as kind of like an executive assistant or anything. Right. Um, so I moved back to San Francisco and basically spent kind of like a few months really trying to figure out a lot of stuff and kind of like rebuild because to some degree like mickey in college was like os version one and it just wasn't working it, it was just not working um and there's a lot of reasons why but i think the the biggest way that sort of manifested was like a really kind of deep depression and not knowing what to do next, you know. So for the first two, three years, like after graduating college, um, I really was just, I, I didn't know about the data field. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had never ever coded anything, like not SQL. I'd run maybe like two or three R scripts uh, for like my biostats class. Uh, I tried passing a C++ like CS 101 class, which for the life of me, I still don't understand why they teach that as a CS 101. Like they complain about the STEM pipeline and then they literally toss that class out there. I, I mean, really a class, like a language that involves compilers, that's the first thing you toss at 
an 18 year old or, or 16 year old or whatever. Right. I mean, I think most pipeline, schools right? don't anymore, but yeah. Yeah. The smart ones have switched to Python, which yeah. is great. But you know, when I was then going, the second class is C. Yeah. Assistance. Yeah. And when I was going to UCSD, this was pre, they now have a data science program. When I was there, um, I think the closest thing you could get is maybe, maybe this, maybe math or stats. Um, so they didn't have data science there yet. Um, so the, yeah, so the first two, three years, like I had kind of spent it doing different like ops jobs. I'd worked at various early stage startups for the first three years. I actually spent a third of it basically unemployed <laughs> because I had these stints at these businesses or companies that would last like five to seven months long. And, you know, during that time, I, I was getting a lot of like conflicting advice. You know, some people were like, oh, you should pursue your passion. And I'm like, but I have a lot of passions and interests and none of them seem to pay money. And then, you know, you had my family going like, God, just land a job that has medical insurance. And they're like, how did you graduate college with an econ degree and not go into investment banking? They're like, everyone in Japan that graduates with an econ degree goes into investment banking. What are you thinking? So, you know, at that point, um, I was, tr I was basically trying to do everything to just kind of like skill build. So, you know, I started taking classes um, at JC. So junior college or the community college system. Um, we have a campus in San Francisco, Golden City College of San Francisco, um, and they uh, actually have a fashion program. And so I was really interested at some point, I'm like, well, maybe I should try like doing my own sort of fashion company. Um, and because I didn't really know anything about fashion, I'm like, okay, I need to I need to understand the supply chain aspect of it. That is so, so important. You're not understanding that like actually fulfillment is, it's kind of handled by other companies and it's actually not that difficult. Um, it's just a money thing and figuring out, you know, how you want to do it. But uh, so, you know, I started taking fashion classes at City College. And then at the same time, um, this was around when MIT started putting their uh, supply chain, um, MITx courses on edX. And so I'm like, okay, well, I'll go ahead and I'll sign up for these like supply chain classes, which are basically like operations research classes, which are really hard. And you actually do need a program and you do need to understand like statistics, which traditionally has been like a painful sort of Achilles heel of mine. Um, and that's when I started getting really interested in analytics when I was like, okay, so there's this like kind of whole space I don't understand. Um, so I started doing the classes and sort of using what I learned in the, in the supply chain classes I managed to kind of sort of parlay that experience and the kinds of problems I've worked on into um, a role over at Sunrun, which is the nation's largest residential solar company, um, working specifically in strategic finance. Um, so working as a financial analyst there. Um, and at that point, that I think really was what kind of kicked off sort of the rest of the ro roles that followed within analytics. Um, but yeah, but in essence, like the, my love for fashion and kind of what I wanted to create out of it, that's really kind of what jump started the sort of me going like, this could be a thing. Um, let me just kind of like figure it out and let me just try to kind of work on projects there and kind of flipping back between sort of upskilling and then like taking that, what whatever skills I develop and trying to turn it into like experiences like at companies. Um, I know. That's a lot. <laughs> no, I love Sorry. it. Well, you know, I, I think starting at the end and, and working back is like the idea that you start somewhere and you like pull on a thread, like that gives you traction, right? It gives you something to build off of. And you can, you know, learn more about different areas of, for example, a fashion industry. For me, like virtually identical story with sports is that like, I don't really know what I want to do. I know I like playing golf and I want to get better at golf. I start analyzing my data like that leads into me learning more about data that makes me like find this whole career through something that I, you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, if I'd ever read a line of code in my entire life, I'd probably tell you no. Right. Um, yeah, I also, yeah. yeah. I also think it's really incredible that, you know, you have come so far from what you were describing from this rock bottom, you were able to effectively reinvent yourself. And it wasn't this like, overnight thing this was an iterative thing where i from from every interaction that i've had with you to date you do seem like a fully functioning adult which is a pretty a pretty big change to make over time um i also think that that's really inspiring to say hey like i was in this place where i had a not a great gpa out of school 
I had, uh, you know, I, I, you know, you didn't even have a driver's license as you described, but you were able to break into this data science career field. You were able to break into the machine learning uh, engineering career field, uh, which are very coveted and difficult to get into in general. And you were able to do that over, you know, a, like a, a reasonable period of time. It just took iteration and effort. Um, something that people don't know about me is I also took five years in college. Uh, I also actually had, I think it was a 2.25 GPA after my first three years. And I learned one of the greatest life hacks of all time, which is you transfer schools and you get a clean slate GPA. Uh, so I, I did that and I was able to graduate with like pretty close to a 4.0 in the second school. And nobody asked about the, the grades before you transferred in the job market. So if you really screwed yourself in your first couple of years of college and you're listening to this, transferring school is not a bad option either. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of learning, obviously, that took place during your experience there. And I kind of want to jump into this topic. I was going to save it for later, but I would really like to hear about how you did make that personal change over those couple a couple of years um like you talked a little bit about the job change but like what did you do like with like in your mind or like or whatever it was to be able to make a change from someone who like you felt like you were rock bottom to essentially actuating on a lot of your dreams yeah and i think um it was definitely like a process i think it started off with Oddly enough, like the like studying anthropology, it it really helped me, and I don't regret it. I do kind of wish I had sort of added on, like like you know, it's, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? Like, so I do kind of wish I had sort of built in more options for myself. And to be honest, that's kind of the way I run my career now. Is I very much deeply like as much as possible. I try to build an optionality for myself um, because I've just seen like even let's see, it's been seven, eight years since I graduated college. Uh, within that time, I've worked for oh, almost like seven, eight companies. Um, I've held like four different kinds of roles, if you think about it. I've held like a non-data anything ops sort of grouping of roles. I've worked as a data analyst. I've worked as a data scientist. And you know, more recently, I started working as a machine learning engineer. So, so much has changed even with just within seven years. Um, so for me, I try not to I try to plan with the understanding that the plan is probably bad, but it's just directional guidance. So the first step that really kind of helped honestly was going away to college and switching to anthropology because, you know, especially like in the States, we, and, and also too, like in data science and machine learning, unfortunately, there's a lot of this kind of like tribalism in sort of this, um, you know, my way goes. There's a lot of this like gatekeeping and ivory wall situation um where people believe that like because for whatever reason like you know they have a perspective it's right and that's just not true um you know so that was i think the first step was to opening my eyes was this idea that like actually if you compare sort of like how different cultures or different societies have solved very similar problems they've all done it in really truly unique ways and so first off it's acknowledging the the validity of other options right um but i think the second part that sort of I think the rock bottom was necessary because um, what I've kind of observed so far, and this is through like mentoring at different data science programs and also even my own interactions with people who reach out to me and they're like, can you help me get this job? Right. A lot of times the the successes that you see in like in people's professional lives and like education or whatever, um, they really follow from changes or existing patterns of excellence in their personal lives, right? Um, so for me personally, um, I had to hit rock bottom in order to acknowledge that sort of a lot of these things that I had internalized through like both family relationships, uh, you know, through even kind of like the high pressure culture of like Asian excellence in high school, um, they were really broken messages. Like for example, um, you know, having a really fixed mindset, this idea that you either got it or you don't, right? Um, even, for example, um, codependency and learned helplessness, those were, to me, two concepts that just blew my mind. Because, you know, when I, so say, I graduated college, and then I was basically unemployed, and I was just trying to, like, find a job, right? Um, 
what I started doing was I started doing just a lot of like personal research and study for those three months. I consider that sort of my like personal development sabbatical where I basically said, okay, instead of kind of like <laughs> shooting down the whole personal development stuff, I'm going to go read a bunch of self-help books. I'm going to really like try to understand instead of being a victim, I'm going to try to really understand like who am I as a participant in this system and what what sort of attitudes and, and kind of beliefs make up the system that I perpetuate around me. Um, so books like, for example, uh, Beyond Code Pensy by Melody Beattie, that was something that was really, really, really important, um, especially too, because I feel like I've seen a lot of these patterns in a lot of like immigrant or Asian families that are very similar to myself. Um, it was helpful in acknowledging that like, look, you can like love your friends and family, but sometimes they don't when you try to change yourself or improve yourself, it changes your relationship with them. And sometimes you'll get a lot of blowback for that. And it's because that of that changing relationship. Um, other books that were really helpful for me were uh, The Defining Decade with, by Meg Jay. So it was so comforting to me. Good one. Yeah, like D Defining Decade by Meg Jay and also Cal Newport's like So Good They Can't Ignore You and also um, uh, Reed Hoffman's The Startup of You. Those three books like really cemented the new ideas and knowledge for me that first off, um, you know, if you have a growth growth mindset, right? Um, first off, you know, a lot of skills, a lot, of, a lot of things in life are skill based and skills can be built up. But more importantly, there's like a certain type of skills, this, this, um, uh, you know, professional capital right, that you can kind of build up. And if you can kind of build it up in the right way and you can invest in the right way, that will just kind of like propel you forward. So a lot of these breakthroughs, they came from both a combination of like self-study, um, a lot of self-reflection, like something that I had learned during that time. Um, it's a form of therapy called trauma narratives. And there's this idea that, you know, what they say is that the story you tell yourself is the story you'll live and repeat. And so there's, at one point I sat down, I took my computer out. I basically said, okay, like what I'm going to do is I'm going to reframe a lot of this, like sort of this trauma that had kind of happened both in college through like the constant failures and like other sort of like personal stuff that happened. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to frame it in a way such that it kind of contributes to it's, it's an arc in my, in my sort of success narrative. And it's a very, very powerful technique. Um, yeah. Like, uh, I, I didn't know it was necessarily called trauma narratives at that time, but I had a few friends who were studying psychology. I said, you know, why don't you try this for yourself? They're like, because what you need to do is you need to change the story that you keep repeating. Because if you don't do that, there's never going to be any hope for you. And so that was something that also really helped me a lot was I kind of reframed the story of my like past failures. I said, this is what I'm doing now. And then I literally wrote like a, a play of this is Mikiko in the future. This is what successful Mikiko looks like. Um, you know, and I had even planned out to like one to two to, to five years. I didn't know if any of it was even gonna come true. I was like, at that point I was like, I was like, man, if I can get, just get a job, um, like the hair salon job, I'm like, that'll already be really good. But having that, that change in the story really kind of helped me both inter like it helped me internalize and also helped how I communicate to others. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is brought to you by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade line of products and solution. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions, and I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that the Z line can come standard with Linux, and they also can be configured with the data science software stack. With the software stack, you can get right into the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of having to completely reconfigure your new machine. Now back to our show. I love that so much. I mean, there's a couple, a couple experiences that, that I've had that, that I think really point to a similar thing. I'm actually reading this book right now. Actually, I just finished it. It's called Effortless. And it's yeah. essentially the idea is how, how do you make like hard work or good things feel effortless around you? And one of the concepts they talk about is like residual, um, like residual like profit over time but that doesn't have to come 
uh, in like a pure financial perspective, right? If we invest in certain things about ourselves, it pays dividends over time and it compounds. Like one of those things that we can invest in is like a different perspective on the world, right? Like if we change how we view success and failure, that carries on through our whole life and that continues to build on itself. Um, there's a similar sort of exercise that you do in it's, it's the four hour work week, I think it is the book, but you essentially like plan out your life and you say, Hey, this is how much money I have to make to like have everything that I want. You like calculate it all out. Right. Mm -hmm. And part of that is like, okay, how do I get to those things? And if you have a clear roadmap, even if you don't hit exactly on the roadmap, because the things you want might change. Right. But if there's a clear path towards what you uh, believe success to be or a narrative that you want to tell that gives you a lot of power to make decisions about that over the course of the, the rest of your life or however long out you plan, right? You could say, oh, I have this great opportunity to do exactly this. Oh, I have another opportunity that would lead me down this other path, but it's also really great. And I think I want to take it. You can just start writing that new story, but at least you have some base of reference to compare it to. Um, I also think that for, for people, I mean, I, I grew up in a family where my, my dad is, is Chinese, my mother is Caucasian. And the experience of culture clash, it, it really shaped my life a lot, right? So like from an Asian perspective, there's a lot of essentially like control exerted, right? Where uh, in, in a lot of Asian families, it, I forget what the research was, but they pulled, I think it was East Asian people, and they asked if they would rather have them make their decisions or their parents make their decisions for them. And I think it was like a, a majority that said they would prefer for their parents to make their decisions for them, right? Whereas if you ask Americans that, it's complete flip the other direction. And if I'm wrong about this, like in the comments, please let me know. <laughs> Let's make sure I get the research correct. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think the idea still stands. When you're in a, 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 a split household in that sense, what do you do? Like, what do you feel is right? I'm living in America. I feel like, yes, I should listen to my parents, but also like everything culturally is telling me that I should trudge my own path and do a lot of these things. And it wasn't till I reconciled that in my own brain. It's like, Hey, this is what I want to do. Like, um, how do I figure out that this is what I want to do? And how do I reconcile that with what my parents or what they want to do? Because you know, both my parents are doctors. They clearly wanted me to go into medicine. And I had to tell them that, okay, yeah, yeah, dad, my grades are not good enough, uh, at least right now to, to become a doctor. Um, but, you know, it's not just an internal battle. It's like, how do I navigate the family dynamics and the, yeah. the like, <laughs> but the friend dynamics and all of these other things that are out there, which is, uh, you know, it's a bear, but you're a living, you know, a success story in my mind that it's like, hey, you know, we can reinvent ourselves. We can work through ourselves by having these meaningful conversations by like looking into our past experiences and, and evaluating and controlling what they mean to us. Because to me, that's the, the most important thing is like we can, we can be dominated by our, our past or we can use our past to dominate our future. Um, and uh, if anyone is familiar with David Goggins, he, he also did a pretty good job of that. He's one of my favorite, like, inspi in, inspirators and in most inspiring people on in that front as well. Yeah, well, it's funny. So my, my mom's actually an ultra runner. So not only does she have that fierceness oh my <laughs> at like 70 of running ultra marathons, but she's also Japanese. So, um, you know, talk about a tiger parent. Um, I, I love her. Um, but uh, yeah, it's some of those, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I feel like a lot of the discussions you have sort of in the political arena about the, the contribution of the contribution in the place of immigrants in the US, I feel like you get in the living room. <laughs> You're like in the living room. I am firsthand experiencing that. Um, and there was a lot of like, I think, you know, I, I really tried doing like the, the good daughter thing for many years. And, you know, I think trying to live by those words, it broke me. I'm just going to be honest. Like it, 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 it broke me almost beyond reason. Um, because I remember like my last year of high school, right? Like I was doing like, um, oh man, I was like editor of the paper. I was captain of the cross country team. I was also captain of the fencing team. 
Um, I was also doing like 10 AP exams and seven APs classes. And the reality is like, did I need to work that hard to, to get in? No, I mean, you know, like I know people who put in far less effort and they got into the same schools I did in more, right? I got into Berkeley and San Diego. I didn't get into LA. Um, and I know people who got into like way more of the IVs or like the, you know, the, the brand name um, um, UCs by putting in like maybe two thirds or one third of the effort that I did. And, you know, and this is one of those things I've had to struggle with where it's like, do I do what they say exactly? Or do I try to honor the sacrifice and the intent of what they say, right? It's, it's that whole like, do I give them what they want or what they sort of need? And like something that I sort of learned through like the codependency books was that uh, if you just kind of keep giving into the void, you're not going to get anything back. And like, if anything, like you, by kind of removing someone else, by like putting your problems out there or removing your problems from, from someone else, you know, you're not giving either party sort of the um, accountability and ownership to kind of make the decisions that they need to. So long story short, at some point I stopped listening to them and I stopped telling them about my career moves because, you know, I think around like, okay, um, so graduate college 2013. And then I spent three years. So around 2016, I think, which is when I joined Sunrun. This was like in that period of time where I was working as an analyst. Um, I stopped listening to what they said. Um, because like, I think it's just, it's a different world out there than, you know, what our parents were experiencing when they were trying to go into like the workforce. Right. Nowadays, I, in, in some regard, I feel like college, I feel like my high school counselors really kind of did a number on my high school because the line that they were selling was, you know, you need to be well-rounded. Why do you need to be well-rounded? Because you need to get into college and colleges appreciate people who are well-rounded. So they basically were were telling people to sacrifice a lot, like you know long term for short term gains, and the long long term is that our economy does not does not care if you're well rounded. What our what our economy wants, what the job, what the workplace wants, is they want excellence, and you know there's only so far you can be a generalist before you're just not that valuable <laughs> in any one particular thing. And so I think like in trying to be well-rounded in trying to like fit that mold, um, it just was not working. And so I am like very grateful and blessed that I hit that rock bottom um, because that gave me the room to clean slate it, like build back up. Um, and specifically that was, you know, that was a really fun period of time because I was picking up new hobbies. Um, you know, I started learning how to ride motorcycles and how to fix motorcycles. Cause I'm like, well, I'm not gonna get a driver's license unless I can get a motorcycle license. And in California, you need to have a driver's license to get a motorcycle endorsement. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna go ride a motorcycle. Um, so it was a, a period of like massive reinvention, um, but also just trying to figure out for, for myself what worked. Cause that traditional advice of the like, I don't know, go find a company, stay there for five, 10 years, um, go to like an MBA program or, or whatever, it, it didn't work for me. I mean, for one thing, there's not a single graduate program alive that will take me, for one thing. Um, not even like University of Arizona, which, eh, <laughs> I don't know if they should be turning away someone like me, but, um, you know, uh, so that door has, has essentially been closed to me, um, almost indefinitely from what it sounds like, because when I was first trying to figure out how to get into data science, I had read all the advice online and everyone's like, oh, you need to go get a master's. You need to do X, Y, Z. So of course, you know, I call a bunch of master's programs. I'm like, hey, you know, um, I, I'm working as a data analyst slash hybrid data scientist at Autodesk. Um, I can get some VP recommendations. And they're like, mm, what was your GPA? I'm like, I'm like, does that really matter five years after I graduated? Like, you know, I, I've like helped like produce forecasts for like million dollar sort of SKU items and, and all that. I'm, you know, I'm like helping this big, interesting area within Autodesk called BIM, which is 3D um, modeling and planning software for construction companies. I'm like, wait, really? You're not going to, even with letters. And so at that point, I was like, look, you know, if they're going to treat it like a club with any exclusive club with bouncers in the front, I'm just going to go find a new club because clearly they don't want me there. So 
grad school off the table. Um, the whole, why don't you stick with company for, for a number of years? In part of it was that I was always looking towards growth in my skills and experiences. So a lot of times that ne necessitated moving out to a new role um, to take on new sort of challenging projects. Cause I knew that ultimately that is what my growth would be dependent on. It wouldn't be dependent on certifications or whatever thing, whatever skills I could put on the LinkedIn skills section. It's dependent on the projects that I work on, the experience that I develop and the value that I can show. And that's something that I think it, 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 they're still not quite understanding. So the healthiest thing at some point was to just not include them in my decision making process. Like I give them sort of what happens after, or my mom finds out on LinkedIn when I change my job status or something. It just happened twice um, <laughs> where she called me up and she went, how could you do this? I went, I just switched, I switched jobs for a 20 I'm to 30% money. <laughs> uptick in my base salary. Did I wrong you in some way? <laughs> she didn't talk to me for two weeks um, <laughs> when I did that. Um, you know, so at some point I say this to people and it can make them uncomfortable. I'm like, sometimes, uh, especially if you come from um, an Asian background, if you come from I have friends who are from the Caribbean or friends from Africa who, you know, in India, I'm like, sometimes you have to not include your family in the decision-making process of your life. You, you got to do what you need to do. And every time you invite them into your life and, and, and you essentially ask them for feedback, you're just signing up to basically have a really bad time, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, one, one funny thing that I've realized, and this might be a mass generalization, but I think it's true. Ask your parents, friends, like how your parents feel about you, and they only say good things about you, right? But if you talk to your parents directly, they'll, they'll never compliment you. Though, and you know, to, to my parents' credit, they've gotten a lot better with that. I think that I sort of broke the system because I was such a failure out of the gate. Like I did not participate in school. Like I was an awful like student all the way through my third year of college. And then, you know, I, I've talked about some of the life events that happened and things turned around, but my parents were just so conditioned and beat down and just like so disappointed that any success at that point, they were like, oh my goodness, <laughs> like, 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 we don't want to ruin this. <laughs> he might make something of himself. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that like doing something for other people is, is never going to be as fulfilling or worthwhile. And, you know, I'm in a situation now where you like my parents get to see like nice residuals of, of the work that I do. My dad gets free golf tickets. He gets to, to, you know, to hear about experiences that he wouldn't otherwise do. And he's starting to realize hopefully that, like, and I will say my dad's like pretty Americanized. Like he owns, you know, he's like, he had always um, told me that like, you want to be your own boss. That's the way that he had, had found success in America for himself. But there's also like, oh, you want to go into medicine because it's a very stable career. There's all of these things. And I'm like, dad, you know, after this pandemic, a lot of the most stable jobs or what people perceive to be the most stable jobs were not quite as stable. You know, like a lot of these huge companies were letting a lot of people go or furloughing them or whatever it is. Like, frankly, the content creation side of my life had, the, had more success than it had ever had. Like that's the entrepreneurial side of what I do, which is less, which is more risky, something I have complete control over or something I have essentially no control over of what the, the company does on a macro level. Um, I will say in terms of grad school, I, I thought your, uh, your commentary was pretty interesting. I got turned away from a lot of the masters in data science or computer science programs because of, I got a D in calculus in college, right? This is before I transferred. And so after I transferred, I essentially had, I had like, I graduated like a three nine, right? Yeah. I did a master's in global commerce, which is like a business related degree. I graduated with another three nine. And so they're telling me that I am not academically qualified to pursue this other master's degrees degree when I've proved like essentially getting a 4.0 in these two consecutive programs. Um, and you know, I also, I took the GMAT, right? 
Mm -hmm. I got, I think I got a 700 on the GMAT, which is like decent. It's good enough to get into most business schools. Yeah. But I got, I think like a 70% on the quantitative. Um, and they were like, oh, that's too low. You have to take the, the, um, the GRE also to make sure. And I'm like, lady, I'm not like applying for, uh, uh like a PhD in physics. Like I want to do this master's in computer science program where I might have to know what like big O notation is, right? I have yeah. to understand finite math and linear algebra. Like, what, like what's going on? You know, I mean, this is ridiculous. I've, I've, I've given you this proven tracker. I was a management consultant. Yeah. I've done all these things. Uh, the, the gatekeeping in academia, in my mind, is what's going to make academia obsolete, especially when it comes to these technical domains, right? Because we have, um, you know, you're talking about the projects and being in control of your workflow and your control of your ability to land a job. Like, once we realize that the academic institutions don't need, you know, like, we don't have to give up any of that control to them, a lot of people are freed from that. You know, that, that to me is unbelievably empowering. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, it, and it's funny because, you know, around this period, um, you know, I had sort of, this is the data analyst like period of my life, right? Um, that was around the, and I had gotten sort of rejected from a bunch of these, um, a bunch of these programs. And I was like, okay, well, I might have to basically go back to undergrad, like to do computer science to, to get into a master's program. Um, and around that time, I, I had started hearing about Springboard's data science, uh, data science bootcamp, and you know I had taken a look at it. And something that to me was very sort of attractive was like the project basis and also being able to work with someone in industry, um, because I realized that both at um, at uh, Sunrun and at Autodesk, I didn't. And I had, I had tried making internal moves to data science within Autodesk. I was like a data science analyst hybrid, but that, that was based on like the business side. Um, so I had tried making internal moves, also got no success there. So I was like, okay, well, I don't know what else to try. So Springboard came up and I remember looking at it going like, okay, this is gonna be the price of rent for me monthly. And it, it was, it was it was basically like $1,700 a month. Um, the idea was that it would be six months long. I end up taking nine, um, you know, but uh, I just didn't really see another way I could kind of progress within data science because it's like, okay, great. So basically all the grad schools are saying I'm not good enough. I can't get an internal transfer. Um, you know, I clearly need to build up skills. At that point, I didn't even know, I didn't know Python um, either. I was only doing stuff in R in SQL and Tableau. Um, you know, so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give this a go. Um, and it, it was basically, yeah, it cost rent. So, you know, but at the same time, I'm like, if I can find the, if I can find the right job, um, I, that will allow me some flex, I can work full time and I can do this on nights and weekends, which is what I ended up doing, um, while keeping up a pretty intense bodybuilding schedule. Because at that point, um, I was doing bodybuilding, or I was at least going to the gym and training, uh, maybe twenty hours a week, or something. I see all the the weights back there. You're <laughs> cutting on travel time, at least. Oh yeah, totally. Um, yeah, you know, I think after quarantine, I don't see myself going back to a regular gym at this point. Not with the power cage and and the you know the air bike and um, the bump plates. So. Um, yeah, so I ended up doing Springboard for six, nine months. And it was really, it was such an amazing experience, um, especially my mentor, uh, Rajiv Shah. He was working as a senior data scientist at Data Robot. I forgot where he is now. Um, but learning from him, working through the projects and taking those learnings. And I sort of treat it kind of like an apprenticeship program in a way. So I had my like work as like an analyst at WalkMe. And by that point, I had moved away from Autodesk to Walkley. Everyone around me was kind of saying like, oh, well, you can't take a title cut because that'll look really bad. And, you know, if you go from a data scientist to an analyst, then um, it just, it doesn't look good and it'll look like you're regressing. And I'm like, well, but I think what's more important is being able to, um, so, so Autodesk is like this huge company. It's got like more than 50 plus products. It's very matrixed. It was very hard to like get 
kind of a greenfield space, you know. With Walk Me, even though I took a title cut, I had the opportunity to kind of build things up from the foundation. And more importantly, I could, I could take everything I was learning on the side and I could kind of build it into projects. And so that's kind of how I did it for nine months was I would go through the courses and the learnings in, um, um, in Springboard. Um, you know, I would do that at lunchtime and at night. Um, I would do work right nine to five around five o'clock, I'd go to the gym for three hours, and then I would sort of rinse and repeat for like nine months. Um, but that really kind of set the foundation for being able to then get a job as a data scientist over at Lavongo, which is now Teladoc because it was acquired. Um, you know, and it was just, it was, it was such a great, valuable experience. And I know a lot of people who are like, oh, well, boot camps are kind of like, they're a ripoff, you know, they're kind of like hustling, hustling you for the money, but it really is about like what you, you get what you put into it. And I didn't sort of treat my mentor as like, um, okay, you're going to help me like correct my assignments or whatever. I really kind of treat him as like, in a way, sort of like a real time day science career coach, where it's like, I would, I, yes, I worked on projects, but I would go like, I'm trying to get this stuff going at work. How should I approach it? And he would basically go like, this is how you have the conversations with your key stakeholders. This is how you do, you know, X, Y, Z, um, you know, and it's, it's definitely something I would encourage, especially for people who were in a similar background to me, you know, if you <laughs> can't get into grad schools, but you need a more structured learning format. Um, it's a really, it's a really great way to go. And I ended up going back to them um, la early this year, actually to do their machine learning engineering bootcamp track. Um, so yeah, like I, I highly recommend it, but I think it's what's, what's really important is that like people kind of do for themselves what they need to. There's a lot of this noise, like in the data science and machine learning space, like, oh, you need a PhD. Oh, you need a master's. Oh, whatever. Right. And like, at the end of the day, it's, it's, um, you know, they're not paying your rent. They're not helping you get promoted. They're not paying your mortgage. They're not sending your kids to school. Um, like why should what these other people say matter, even, even family and friends who, you know, my parents are like, oh, AI, oh, look, look at this credit card offer that we got that was like pre-approved for us. It's like, this is literally the result of someone's like machine learning model that they built. They've targeted you as a sucker and they sent you that mail, you know, and they just, they're like, no, no. <laughs> got him. Um. <laughs> You know, I, I love that take on, on boot camps is that what you put in is what you get out, right? I, I, I'm a personally a huge believer that whether it's like a master's program, a boot camp, a certificate, or just like self-learning on YouTube, each one of those things could be the perfect scenario for someone, right? Yeah. Like, like for me, I don't know if I would necessarily go back and do a master's in computer science again, but I know after having another master's degree and my, like in my college experience, I really learn well in a classroom setting, like a very formal classroom setting where there's clear goals, like grades. I have like a really ruthless mean competitive streak. And I love like breaking the curve if there is one. And that helps me like get excited about learning in a classroom setting. Um, you know, for other people, you know, I have a friend who had a, has a PhD in physics and he went through a boot camp in order to pick up relevant skills to be able to land a job. For him, what he got out of that boot camp was like a lot of the resume coaching, a familiarity with a lot of the newer tools. And he was able, that combined perfectly with his PhD background, right? To leverage him straight into a data science position. I think there are people very much like yourself where it's like, okay, um, I'm already in a job, like access to universities or more traditional forms of education are, are like, either a huge pain in the butt to get into. There's a lot of overhead associated with them. I can't do them on my own time. There's a lot of limits to traditional education. It's like, hey, this is a great opportunity to like upskill, to, to get one-on-one -on -one, uh, like mentorship and, and these types of things. It, yes, it costs money, but you're working. You have a job already, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, there's another group where it's like, hey, I want to land my first data analyst job. Like maybe I've worked a little bit. I personally think boot camps are a really good fit for them if they can afford it, because like the overhead of getting an analyst job versus a data scientist job 
is in my mind an experience thing right like i generally yeah. look at like hey like three years after you've been a data analyst or two years or whatever it is depending on the work like it's it should be very reasonable and easy to make a transition into data science uh, maybe not easy but it should that's like a a reasonable track in my mind um but yeah i mean like I, I'm a huge proponent of certificates and all those things as well and personal projects. But what you're getting with those is you need more discipline, right? Yeah. You're not like paying as much and you need to do this on your own time. So you have to be able to structure these things a lot better. And, you know, same thing with self-study and doing all these projects. If you have the discipline to be able to do those things, like I see no reason to pay for education in any way, shape or form, right? But I personally did not have that discipline when I was learning uh, at all. Um, so something you brought up is you, you went back and you, and you went down the machine learning engineering track uh, at Springboard. I'm interested to learn more about why you decided to switch from a more pure data science, data analyst roles to machine learning engineering. Yeah, absolutely. And, the, and well, <laughs> so I actually didn't even finish the machine learning engineering track um, at Springboard because um, they we're so good for the data science track and, and i'm not saying they're not for the ml engineering track right but it is a, a question in a matter of picking the resources that is right for you at you know at the time that you need it um so right so okay so i got my data scientist gig at livongo teledoc um spent a year there and i think in the meantime i was also working uh, part time on a real estate tech startup called Sidewalk AI, where I was basically doing like ML data. I was doing more kind of edge stuff because um, the the interesting part is that um, it can be sometimes really hard to get the good projects in a company setting, especially if you're kind of the low person on the totem pole. And what I kind of recognized was that, you know, I was seeing kind of like where companies were going with data science and machine learning, right, in production around me. And I just felt like my role and position was not, it, it was not, the projects and the opportunities were not moving like with the industry. And I and I think part of it too was the real, like, realization that uh, I was never gonna be a really good data scientist. And part of this was observing the really amazing data scientists that I work with. And I looked at them and I was, and I looked at the work that they produced. I looked at their backgrounds. So I'm like, you know what? I don't really care about research. I really, really do not care one iota about the latest, greatest algorithm, all that, all that other stuff. What I saw as being the bottleneck was actually getting these machine learning models um, into production in such a way that the company and users were, were actually benefiting from it. Um, and part of it is I think it, it it takes like strategic it takes strategic and um intentional investment on the part of the company um because a lot of times what ends up happening is that they're like well our engineers and data scientists are too expensive to not be doing the things that they're doing but then at some point it's like well where do the pocs go um and i think there's a lot of companies like recently where i was seeing like a lot of these like data science or ml startups where um they either had a shutdown or you know, they weren't in, they weren't investing in bridging that gap such that all this investment that was going into data science. Now a lot of companies are moving into like data engineering, for example, or like um, machine learning engineering or data ops. So I, it was just part of, it was like twofold. One, it was a realization that like, look, the industry is basically starting to ask this big question. Like, how do we actually get value out of all these data scientists that we've just like hired, um, especially when there isn't data? And then this kind of more internal realization that, um, you know, it, it, I just did not have the interest and I just didn't see the end game for me in data science. Um, so part, so it was nice. I, I was working at, and this was like a really crazy, like six or seven months where I was working like full-time as a data scientist at Teladoc or Livongo. Um, I was also on the weekends working on this real estate tech startup, trying to actually figure out the nitty gritty problems of like, how do we actually build an infrastructure from scratch? And how do we literally like set up an end to end sort of system and pipeline? And then I was also, <laughs> and then I was also teaching at like, uh, both Springboard and, or as mentoring at Springboard and Data Science Dream Job, where 
all our data scientists are basically going like, okay, like how we have this model now, like what, what do we do with it? How do people interact with it? It's like, wow, a lot of questions about engineering. So about, you know, seven to eight months into the data scientist role, I started exploring with, with Sidewalk. And then kind of when I got to a year with Livongo Teldoc, I sort of made the decision that, you know, I had saved up enough money. Um, I had a plan for how I wanted to sort of execute that um, transition to ML engineering. Uh, so I basically just quit my job as a data scientist in November of last year to essentially do my own like six month sabbatical to really kind of develop the skills that I thought were really important um, while also implementing, trying to implement those skills and experiences um, at Sidewalk. Um, so yeah, and like, I have no regrets. It was hard. Uh, that was like, so, you know, talk about Asian families being upset. Um, yeah, that was one of those times my mom found out on LinkedIn. I, and it was, it was great because I changed my status like on LinkedIn, right? Um, on a Sunday night going, no one's going to see this because Sunday night, that's a slow night, which tells you that I'm not a creator, obviously, um, <laughs> because I wake up in the morning and 150 people have reacted to it. And I'm like, I didn't even know I had this many people in my network. Um, you know, you can turn that off, right? To <laughs> share to everyone. I, well, I, I just didn't think about it. I'm yeah. I just didn't think about it. And then I get the call from my mom going like, what are you doing? How could you? And this has just been a trend of, of trying to explain risk to my parents because from their perspective, they're like, you know, um, Livongo had just been acquired by Teldoc. They were guaranteeing you a year of employment, which during quarantine was big. Right, people. Were, that was a, that was, I think, the same month where Twitter um, and three other companies had a mass layoff. Um, so my my parents were like, "What were you thinking?" And I'm like, "Well, here's the you know here's the beautiful part because we're all at home. This is the time to make that switch because hiring's going to pick up again. Um, you know, six to seven months later, or whatever. Um, that gives me time to like really just block out all the noise." Um, but the other part that really kind of helped was sort of the month before I quit, I had actually been interviewing at a bunch of places and I had gone like five or six last round interviews or something, um, with various companies. So it was hard to explain to them. I'm like, I have money, um, worst case scenario, I can literally go get a job as a data scientist someplace else because the market's so hot. Um, it's just the right timing. You know, I've, I've done the projection for how, which, what my runway is. Um, I had moved to a cheaper place, um, you know, and I was, I was splitting rent. Um, so I'm like, I have a lot of kind of safety net. Um, but with that generation, it's especially like with immigrant families, I think it's really hard because they will, and this is something that like my, my one of my like life mentors, um, I call him Uncle Alfred, was kind of explained to me was that like, you know, when you are, in, when you're an immigrant family or when you're, you know, um, or even like a family that is not very wealthy, right? Um, you just kind of experience stuff happening to you, right? You're just kind of this this boat that's being tossed on the waves. So whenever you, you see something that, it's just very volatile. It's a very volatile existence, right? So whenever you get any sort of like patch of calm, you want to hold on to it for dear, dear life because you don't know if it's ever going to come back again. And more importantly, if you sort of see things as like, if you see yourself as this boat tossing along the waves um, and you don't see it as the result of process, of skill, um, then you just can't believe you just can't believe someone when they said like, no, 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 I've got this, I've got it figured out. You just kind of look at them and go like, well, you're just gonna be an unfortunate statistic or outcome of what happens. Um, so that was something, this, this, this conversation around risk and risk mitigation and informed risk is something that's been a multi-year sort of thing with them. I don't think they're ever gonna sort of be on the same page with me, but it felt like the right move to take that six month sabbatical and to really like double down, invest in doing programs like uh, Springboard's machine learning engineering track in doing full stack deep learning, which was actually the pivotal one 
that really helped me make the move. Um, you know, so yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's fun, right? Like with those, <laughs> those family conversations. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you know, there's always like that flip side of risk. And like, how do you quantify the risk of not achieving what you want? How do you quantify the risk of not like being healthy or not being happy or not having a lot of those things? And, you know, I think at the end of the day, like all of our parents in some way, they want us to be happy. They just yeah. think what we need to be happy is what they need to be happy. And, and yeah. there's a lot of disconnect and dissonance between those things. But, you know, I think the, the, the risk tolerance and the risk understanding is something that I, I like really resonate with as well. I mean, one of the reasons why I accumulated or tried to accumulate skills in business and computer science in particular is that I felt like, hey, if I take the shots that I want career-wise or entrepreneurship-wise or whatever it is, and they don't work out, I have something I can fall back on. Like I am pretty confident I can land a job somewhere if I really needed to in a, you know, in a month or two. Right. And it might not be the job that I love. It might not be what it is, whatever it is, but it's like, you know, building the skill set that's somewhat flexible, but fairly specialized. Like, is there really any, any negative to doing that aside from the opportunity cost of time? Right. It's like what you were just, we were talking about before with building up a, a relevant or residual skill set. You know, it, to me, that is worth significantly more than stability in 2021. Like knowing that you can, um, for example, like make money. Like I was re reading uh, uh, the Navalmanac or mm -hmm. the Al Almanac of That's Naval. So and one of the things, that that he describes is that like he believes making money is a skill right mm -hmm. like finding opportunities doing whatever that is right he's like okay if you drop me anywhere in the world with nothing the english-speaking country he could probably in five to ten years accumulate a significant amount of wealth again but yeah. like that is a residual skill that will pay dividends forever right because you've learned how to do it and you can continue to integrate it in i feel the a very similar way about you know, what we do in, in terms of data and, and, um, and systems thinking and picking up new skills continually, uh, you know, people pay what, you know, at some schools, hundreds of thousands of a hundred thousand dollars. So in those skills, like they're worth something like yeah. people wouldn't pay that if they weren't worth that. Right. Hopefully. Yeah, totally. Totally. And I think too, like I, I something that, you know, there, there's some things that I see like on the science machine learning LinkedIn that really kind of bothered me. And one of the things that that sort of bothers me is the gatekeeping obviously is a big one, but also this idea, this kind of fascination with the self-taught unicorn. Um, because first off, I just don't believe that that many exist, um, you know, but secondly, also like, there's a number of ways to kind of get to where one needs to go. Um, and you don't, it's, it seems like there's always these extremes of like, there's like, oh, the academic, you know, brainiac, and then there's the self-taught unicorn. And I'm like, look, like Pete, there's lots of gradients in between. For me, I consider myself informally taught as opposed to self-taught, but also I just try to continuously upskill, right? Because if you are continuously upskilling, um, first off, you have the skills when you need to have them, um, but also you're already kind of preparing yourself for sort of other opportunities that come about. And more importantly, it's not just like this huge, big lift, you know, um, for most people, like I kind of encourage them to basically look like do it on the weekends and nights. Um, you know, like for me, let's see, I, I don't know about you, but I'd say for me, I easily spend a couple hundred dollars easily every month on like self-development and upskilling, but I still also utilize like a lot of free resources as well. Um, there's some really good high quality ones. Um, but for me, it's just, it's so important to continue to invest both in like my professional skill set, but also in like my sort of personal like skills as well. Um, and I, I just, I see that as kind of the future. So I always get questions like, oh, should I go into data science or should I go into data, data analytics? Or is it, is it too late to break in? I'm like, no, it's, it's never like too late to break in. Um, but I think to basically 
it's almost kind of this weird sort of it's like this question that is not quite correct in that it, it's it's like the spirit thing where they're like if i am not in data science i'm not making money no there's a lot of ways to make money um or they're like if i'm not doing machine learning i'm not having a fulfilling career it's like no that's not true at all um i don't think everyone needs to be into data, needs to be a data scientist or a machine learning engineer or data analyst to have a very fulfilling career i do think that it would it behooves people to pick up the skills right like you are only improved by picking up the technical and analytical skills like even on pe on the people in biz op side i think there is some research where it's like managers that are able to like effectively utilize analytics to like improve their performance to improve their teams will essentially get promoted you know faster they'll reap more re rewards and they can um you know pivot into consulting or something like that right like there's no reason not to pick up those skills um and like and i think at the end of the day like that's gonna that's basically what makes people the most successful people i know they're the ones who continuously put in that investment both like professionally and personally yeah well something related to the skills that you mentioned is a I'm a big believer, like you don't have to be a data scientist to use data science, right? Mm -hmm. I, like, like that's one of the biggest misconceptions. And I see so many people that they hear about the data science profession and they're like, oh, I really want to do that. But when we look at brass tacks and look at what their aptitudes or their interests or, or whatever it is, it's just not a good fit. Yeah. And I think that there are so many people that don't have that conversation with themselves or where, you know, it's maybe there, maybe now like parents are telling kids to get into data science. If it's like, oh, this is a great career, whatever it is. And it's like, oh, this, this isn't a good fit for me. You know, like there are elements of data science that I love. There are elements of data science that I'm just like, not that long on, like, to be perfectly honest, like the ML engineering side, like implementation is difficult for me, right? Like it's not something I see myself indexing in really hard because I love the storytelling. I love the exploration. Yeah. I love like trying to to like ask the right questions to get like, like, a like the specific insight. Right. Yeah. And it's not that, you know, you don't do any of that in your work, but it's like, Hey, the, the amount I do in, in my work or in like my specific niche is going to be higher. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just yeah. means that like, Hey, like you're going to find more success there because it fits your specific interests. And I'm probably going to find more success in the data science and maybe even the like data analysis side because that's what I'm, I'm drawn to. And those are like the things that, that I, um, that I like that match my unique set of interest and in skills combined. Um, I'm, I'm also like, I'm starting to realize particularly this year that it's worth spending money on yourself. Like it's worth, like if you have the money to spend, it's yeah. never a bad investment in, in yourself. And I, I'm doing that more in my health than I ever have. And yeah. the return on investment when you invest in your health or in your mind, it's unbelievable. You know, like for example, I, like I go get a massage like once every couple of weeks, or I'm um, like buying healthier foods. Or uh, what was the other one that I got? I, like I, I just bought another one of my the aura rings uh, yeah, to yeah. track my sleep and do all that stuff. Like the energy you get. Let's say over time you get 15 minutes of extra time a day. Right yeah. over the course of your life, the value of that 15 minutes goes up, the, the, like it, it accumulates and the little bit of money you spent, um, I, I just, I can't stress it enough, uh, just how much that is, that has changed who I am. And, and I, I don't ever claim to be successful, but any of the success that I've had, I think is triggered by a lot of those investments. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, like when it comes to health, for example, so I, I just, it's one of these things where, and in some ways I'm very grateful for having grown up in, uh, like in, in a Hapa household. So like, like Hapa, right. For, for, I guess for people who are listening, it's half Japanese or, or whatever, but because a lot of times, you know, I was kind of like forced to do a lot of this translation, but also because of a lot of the conflict I was dealing with at home. And also I was a really weird kid growing up a lot of times I kind of spent sort of looking in outside of groups, you know, I wasn't like an active participant in a 
in like a bunch of different places. I was always kind of this person who was like looking and trying to like interpret and translate out. And in in some ways, it's kind of I feel like helped me not get stuck on labels. So, for example, um, there's a I think there's a period of time, right, like in <laughs> where in like tech and engineering, um, it would be a little bit weird to see people being very healthy um, and working out and um, you know, there was this idea of like, you had to fit a certain stereo nerd stereotype to be an engineer. Um, and I think the stories and the labels that people can give the, give to themselves sometimes can be really damaging because when I, um, when I graduated college, right. I, I did not spend any time in the gym. Like the only reason I signed up for the gym was because all the other people in the startup went to the same gym. They're like, oh, you should go do it. So I, 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 I went and at first it started off just small. It was on the treadmill. Um, but eventually like I got a trainer cause they sort of like talked me into this training program. And, uh, and, and that was like the first step towards eventually being the kind of person who would work out 20 hours a week doing Olympic weightlifting and, you know, working with a dietitian and all this other stuff. And like it, it, for me, it was super helpful, but more importantly, I think a lot of times, like we, we like to kind of celebrate the successes without understanding what goes on underneath. And so one, one of these like inflection points happened when I was like working out at the gym and there's this guy named, shit you not, his name was Angel. Um, he came in, swooped in and he was giving me a lot of feedback. And it was this person like I'd, I'd never met before. I'd probably seen them around the gym and I was like, yeah, okay, I'll, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll implement your feedback. Um, you know, and he went away and eventually like in that, at near the end of the workout, he like came back and he's like, you know, I really like your work ethic. Um, let me help train you. I'm like, okay, I can do this. Um, and one of the things that he taught me was that the gym's a little bit of a magic show He's like, yeah, you see all these people doing like these heavy lifts and these heavy reps. And he's like, you don't see all the dieting that they do. You don't see the supplements that they take. You don't see all the prep work that goes into making them look like that. Um, and for me, that was really eye opening because it's like we can have these labels about people. And in some ways, I did that very early on in my career, in my life where I was like, oh, like, you know, self-help books and personal development, that's not my thing. That's something for like, you know, wimps and losers and all that. Cause that was the, that was like the messaging that I was hearing at home. Um, but being able to like be open-minded to that and going like, look, you know, these are the things I need to do to invest in my life, my health, my, you know, personal goals or whatever. Um, independent of whatever label that you end up taking on, like, that's kind of like what needs to happen. Um, and like investing in like the health part that I think has been, that that's kind of helped me, I think right out quarantine, because like, even though I kind of sort of, I don't say slacked off during quarantine on the physical fitness, the important part is like, I have the map in my head. Like I know how to get back to that. And that is priceless because, you know, if you're starting off for the first time, it's really hard, but if you have the map, you know, you can always come back to it. Well, it's a weird thing with like our bodies too. Like our bodies remember the map. Like, yep. I think it's a lot easier. Like, even if uh, like using, uh, using like the same protocols, if I was like, you know, like shredded out of my mind at one point in my life, even if I got really fat, I'd be able to get back to that just because my body has been there. It's experienced that versus someone who's never been in that shape before. I also think it's harder to like, to go beyond, uh, like to get too out of shape if your body's been in good shape. Like it, it reaches some level of homostasis around like a, a, like a more healthy or like a more muscular physique type of thing. I, I've never been able to, under, to like clearly articulate it, but I got an unbelievable shape in college and I've just wrote it out till now. It's great. I haven't had like just do light maintenance. And it's like, all right. I'm not in great shape now, but starting jujitsu again has been really, has been really good for, for my, my health and my mind. And I, I really, I, I just love this idea of 
Well, I, th I think what you described is one of the reasons why we have a lot of imposter syndrome in data science to begin with, is you you don't see the work people are putting in. You see them posting on Instagram or LinkedIn about their jobs or the crazy analysis they did, but you don't see all of the hours that they put in. You don't see all the time that they put in. You don't see like, you know, all the 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 tears and sweat and blood and and you know, like in the gym, you don't if you don't look carefully, you don't see like the calluses on someone's hands. Right. Yeah. Or that they overcame like they, you know, they blew their knee out last year and they're still able to do this. And um, to me, that was in the same way, one of the largest realizations I ever had. Like I was telling you how I was such a bad high school student. Right. Yeah. You know, I thought I was just like dumb. I had that fixed mindset. But I talked to one of my friends like two years later, who was a very good student. And he told me how much he studied and my brain like fell on the floor. I was like, I didn't think I had that much time back then. Like, how'd you, how did you do yeah. that if, if you were playing sports or doing anything else? Um, I mean, I guess that that for me also is like the only, only child thing is where you have no exposure into how hard anyone else is working. You're kind of isolated. Oh, totally. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I would reconcile that. I mean, I guess I had a lot of cousins and stuff, but just breaking out of that that circle and that mindset maybe just talking to people like I, I was a fairly shy kid not shy now obviously um but 165 but, you know ken's ken's friends 165,000 friends yeah i've made it take that middle school bully i've got <laughs> friends now <laughs> um yeah but I guess one of the last things I want to touch on is is unpacking that a little bit more the in relationship to like outside looking in. That's something I've I've obviously experienced as well. Like again, we've talked about being in between two cultures. I never felt that I was necessarily accepted by white people or Asian yeah. communities. I was just in the middle. And I think for me, that's helped me to be very comfortable with like my independence and charging my own path. And that is one of those things that, you know, I think is, is different from like the Asian culture that, that part of my family comes from is that like, I could not conform to Asian culture because I wasn't accepted by like most of Asian culture. So I had to go into this sort of individualistic route. I had to go into my own place. I had to like be very comfortable with myself. And it seems like that's something you've done as well in terms of being comfortable with yourself and, and like where you are now. Uh, it's a little similar to one of the earlier questions that I that I've asked, but how like how do you become comfortable with yourself, especially within this career when it's changing so much, and like comfortable with what you know? Yeah, absolutely. And like I think, so it's funny. Like so, when I was trying to when I when I was trying to make the bodybuilding thing work, um, I had a lot of angst, right? Because I was like, in to some degree, I do feel like my I don't want to say this is a thing for women, right? But to some, but you know, hypothetically, right, in the evolutionary game, um, there are certain traits men and women are attracted to in the opposite gender, right? And there are certain things that you kind of sort of that unfortunately sort of drive one's self worth or uh, external worth. Um, and that was something that in some ways was really hard that I had to struggle to. But once I was able to kind of get there, it helped a lot was, um, you know, you see all these like Instagram chicks and there's like certain, there's a certain body type and, and shape and like height and all that. And on some ways I was refreshing about bodybuilding as in there was like, there was this figure that bodybuilders try to attain, right? There's like certain shapes and geometry. But on the other hand, it was also one of these things where I'm like, I had to, I had to see it as a journey to become the best version of myself. And once, and once I sort of was able to accept, okay, like this, you know, there are certain kind of, in some ways, accepting kind of the constraints that I have, which is like, look, my bones are only so long. My like body geometry is only so many things. It allowed me to focus on the things that I could change. Um, the things I could change, for example, were first off, like how, uh, how strong I was, what my physical fitness level was um, the work ethic that I put in to all of that. And that's something that I didn't realize that I was known for actually in all the gyms I've worked out in, I have been known for my work ethic. Um, 
And when I could focus on those things, right? Like eating healthy on, um, controlling like my reps and lifts and all that, um, that being able to kind of attain that in like my bodybuilding practice, it helps me in some ways stabilize how I approach like my professional arc as well with this idea that, you know, there are certain things that you just, you just cannot control, right? You can't control if a company like lays you off, you can't control uh, the economic conditions, right? But if you're building the right kind of career capital and you're directionally taking it to where you need to go every day, um, eventually like you will get someplace, right? And this is one of those areas where I think people should focus more on, they should focus on skills and capital and not titles, right? Um, Cause you see like, you see people kind of go after titles or even they go after sort of like compensation um, like for example, like the Fang salary, right? Like you see this on blind, you see this on like other, like, you know, forums on Reddit where everyone's talking about like, oh, well, Fang, 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 sal you know, the salary or whatever, right? And they're comparing like, oh, well, I managed to, you know, like break into data science machine learning in, in like six months self-teaching. Um, and like the first thing someone needs to do is they need to just block all that out. Just don't even look at that nonsense. It's just so depressing if you look at Reddit. Sometimes it can just be a dumpster fire. Um, and, and also it's just all the lies, so yeah, I know all the LinkedIn humble brags too. Like that's also a dumpster fire. Don't look at that. Like, <laughs> um, you know, but the other second part is I do think people kind of need to understand like, what are their constraints? Right. And I don't think their constraints when it comes to their careers, like, um, I think the constraints are not what people think their constraints are. Um, sometimes, for example, I think the constraint is that uh, people, for example, they say they want to go into data science when what they actually want is more money and respect. And that's just not something that is automatically guaranteed going into data science. <laughs> Sorry, I started laughing. Um, I shouldn't have done that. But um, right, like it's being real with yourself about like what you want to get out of life, um, irrespective of all the other noise. Um, and then I think the third part that, that is really kind of helpful is like making a plan and um, really kind of like thinking through the strategy like there's i think that one technique where, right where it's like the five whys you know like you ask yourself and you really introspect like you know what do i really want and, and also what do i need to do to get there right so you see a lot of these like blog posts where people are like oh here are like 100 resources you can use no 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 at any point in time everyone really only has like one or two bottlenecks that are preventing them from moving on to the next step they just need to figure out what those are and it's not going to be the fact that they don't know like five or six different programming languages. It's probably the fact that they are not useful in a single one, right? Because it doesn't matter if it's R or Python. Um, well, okay. Uh, you know, people can go into that debate. Like, okay, for example, if you're doing data analytics, right? It doesn't matter if you're using R and Python. Both of them have really great packages, lots of good resources and examples. Um, the limitation could be someone's just not good in like any one of those, right? But the great part is that that's a skill that you can then make a plan to work on. Um, you know, so I think that is sort of like what helps, but I still kind of struggle with that. And I think the only thing I can really do is make directional progress, like directional incremental progress, and at least understand that I'm making the decisions for myself, um, which uh, I feel like, I feel like a lot of people, you know, they, they need to be okay with like that kind of that failure mode in a way, like understand that, yes, if you make decisions on, on your own, yes, eventually some of them will fail. Um, but at least you can kind of take ownership of that decision or accountability for it. Whereas you could not do that if you were sort of in like a safe sort of place. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, that's just kind of how I, I try to approach it, but it also helps to surround yourself with good people. Um, there's been a few of those pivots where, um, you know, I've had to kind of like shed those social groups. So for example, when I was getting to bodybuilding and when I was trying to get really serious about data analytics, there was a group I used to go, uh, salsa dancing and drinking with three times a week. Um, and eventually like I had to stop that because you can't drink and then go lift and, like, and expect good results. You, you will not get good results. It'll be terrible the next day, especially after three pina coladas um, a week, th three times three. Anyway, but that's beside the point, right? Um, at some point I had to like make those sacrifices 
Um, but if you have like, so I was reading this book, Essentialism. Um, and By the same about, author as uh, yeah. Effortless. Yeah, he talks about essential intents. And I think that is really important. Um, I think people need to come up with those essential intents for themselves and then kind of follow through and really understand like for life changing experiences, it will take time and sacrifice. It is gonna suck. It's very, it's gonna be like very unpleasant. Um, yeah, the nine months I was like working on springboard and also working full time and also going to the gym, that really sucked. I spent most of that time very hungry, literally on a napkin. I would write down the hours that I ate because I, I needed to put three, four hours in between meals. I did all of that, it was nuts. Um, but it was worth it because I was working on those two or three things I thought were most important to me at that time. Um, yeah, I'm hungry now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to get hungry too. I haven't eaten anything yet today, so. Um, oh no! <laughs> well, you know, I, I really think that that overarching metaphor, I, I really liked the, the bodybuilding metaphor of like, hey, you have to rely really heavily on the process. You have to fall in love with the process because the results, a lot of the results are noise. A lot of the yeah. results are lagging. They're, they're, there's so much randomness in the results. Let's take like a, jo a job interview, right? Yeah. Like it could be that it was someone was having a bad day and they didn't, they didn't like what you were saying. It, you could have been the best candidate, but they overlooked you. Your resume could have gotten lost in the mail. Focusing on what you can control in my mind is one of the most important things that we can do. Um, and, and it's one of the only things that we have control over. So I think that that's a, a really incredible place to end just in general with, uh, with a, a great, again, like metaphor bringing different parts of your life together. Um, Mickey, thank you so much for coming on the show. I always enjoy our conversations. This one was, you know, the exact same. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you in one of the next happy hours. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for having me on and uh, letting me talk your ear off. So yeah. But yeah, I'm looking forward to like talking again soon. Heck yeah. Also, what's what's the best place for people to learn more from you, connect with you, anything along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. So um, they should definitely feel free to uh, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, I also do write occasionally on Medium. Tends to be very long, more sort of investigative journalism-esque pieces on like how to like sort of make pivots within data science and machine learning. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely look me up on LinkedIn um, using my name. Awesome. I will link that in the description of the podcast as well.